Welcome everyone. Thank you for creating the time for being here with us. This is our second webinar that we've been hosting in this format of presenting to the world our program. It, this webinar is also supposed to be our reporting mechanism that we are experimenting with this year. So we are recording this call and we're going to send the link to the Charity Commission to tell them to see how we've been spending this part of our budget and saving everyone reporting time. And that's a bit of what we're going to speak here today about. We're going to speak about our first program that we've ever done called Flow Funding. So this concept was created by Marion Weber 25 years ago. And Seth and I, when Be The Earth was being gestated, if that's a word, we're pregnant with Be The Earth, we had the pleasure to meet Marion Weber. She was one of the first people we spoke to. And then it just sounded so amazingly simple and in flow and magical way of disbursing money that we thought, why don't we try with it? And you're going to learn a little more about how the methodology works and the experience of the flow funders that are on the disbursing fund position after being long years on the ground as activists and all that, and also a bit of the impact story. So I'm going to just introduce you to our time together, and you're actually going to listen from the source. So just to give a bit more context, this is our fourth year that Be The Earth is doing flow funding. And each year we refine it a little bit. And now we're with a circle of women that are from three different countries, Brazil, South Africa, and the UK. Three women per country, disbursing funds. And I won't do any spoilers here, but we're gonna, yeah, just share a bit of the methodology, their experience and some stories of what happened. And then we're gonna have some time for questions after. Okay, so thanks again for being here. And I'm going to hand over to the first trio that is going to talk about the methodology. Uh, Ruby and Ondela, actually Alini had a health complication, so she won't be here with us today, but she, her energy is here with us. So please, Ruby and Ondela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Renata. Hello, everyone. Um, so good to be here. Such an honor to be one of the Flow Funders. This is the third year that I've been um, on the program and I've learned so much through the process. Um, so Andela and I will talk a little bit about the methodology. I'll talk about it in general um, and then Andela will talk about it specifically in the context of um, the Be The Earth Flow Funding Program. We have a few slides so I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, one second. Do you see that? Yeah? Okay, I guess you can see it. Um, let me know if you can't. Um, so, yeah, good. So flow funding is a philanthropy program that is based on trust. Its values are flexibility, openness to change and creativity. Um, flow funding presents a very radical proposition as it completely goes against the traditional parameters of grant-based funding where decisions are based on objective rationale, data-backed proposals or capacity for reporting and impact measurement that often goes very much beyond the means of grassroots activists and people who are on the ground who often need funds and resources the most, um, particularly individuals and small-scale projects. Um, rather than data, reports and statistics, the people involved are the key for the flow space to be held by its values. So it's person-centered, women-led, activist frontline and strategic fields of work. Um, through flow funding, social innovators, visionaries, healers, and people from many different um, backgrounds and perspectives who never normally would be in a position to become a philanthropist are empowered to give away money. The concept stemmed from the desire to democratize um, philanthropy and explore innovative and novel ways of giving away money. So donors become initiators um, and then an initiator chooses individuals to give their money to donate it outwardly. So those individuals are called flow funders. Um, so this is a proactive rather than reactive way of giving because you 
identify who you want to give the money to rather than responding to proposals. Um, and it's also a way for large amounts of money to reach many people through small grants. Um, through flow funding, um, money can meet projects and people that funders might not be able to reach on their own as they tend to sit outside of the normal structures um, of grant making like I mentioned before. Initiators can recognize that social innovators are often best placed to identify people in situations where a financial rift could also have a transformative effect on people's lives as they tend to have less access to money and less activists and philanthropists in the first place who would then know that they existed and that these projects were um, available to be supported. Um, once a funder has been chosen, they disperse funds at their own intuition and initiative, and then the gift moves spontaneously as needs and opportunities arrive, arise, and it's very much up to the individual who they give the money to and how much they give the money and how they give the money. And when it comes to the reporting, it's about storytelling um, rather than data. And so there's no application process, like I said, it's very much about spontaneity, democracy, gift giving, community, intuition, adventure and generosity. So I passed on Della to talk about it in the Be The Earth case. Thank you so much, Ruby. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Andela from South Africa, and this is my first year. Um, I'm just going to talk about our journey as flow funders. Um, so as Ruby, as Ruby has just mentioned that um, the initiative is more to bring power to the grassroots individual who then identifies which um, organization or individual has been doing phenomenal work um, and therefore needs support. These are individuals that are outside of the um, quote unquote um, normal um, or they look fancy or you know they are warranting of funding. So in our journey, the flow funders, um, we receive a contract from Be The Earth, um, which then starts the process of negotiation between the flow funder and the organization. It is then that money is deposited into a, the personal account of the flow funder, who then, as Ruby has mentioned, through her initiative and intuition and a trust-based value system, decides which organization they can support or would like to support. Next slide, please, Ruby. The primary focus, uh, the key focus of um, the projects that are supported by flow funders is one, the food and indigenous rights. It is addressing planetary crisis um, at their root causes and aligning initiative with the foundation's core values. And the initiatives and the core values of the organization are investing beyond financial capital and collaborations with partners instead of the traditional grant giving system and also co-creating partnership and be scalable solution, providing scalable um, solutions. Next slide, Ruby. Yeah. And the flow sister circle. Um, in this flow funders, we hold circles every month, um, mediated by the um, foundation's facilitators, um, where we share our challenges and we discuss paths and receive training. In this flow of circles, it is a space for us development um, practitioners, practitioners to actually come together in a safe space and be able to share our challenges that we face. As we know, the job that we do and the tasks that we do to support communities can be quite a challenging opportunity. Thank you. And we're passing over to the experience team. Thank you, Andela and Ruby. Just before the experience team jump in, I think I resonate so much with this program as well because I feel my personal journey was a bit of kind of a flow funding uh, out of a box of a program, but basically having been working on the ground for over 10 years, having been in touch with groups, grassroots, doing amazing projects and many times not being formalized or not being, I don't know, literate or good writers in all, enough to apply to grants or even not being able to measure exactly what their impact was. And that would stop them for, from having access to certain funding. And also on the other hand, seeing all this gigantic amount of funding that go to always the same organizations and realizing that sometimes a hundred pounds, thousand pounds can change a whole community that really spoke to my heart. And also having experienced the hassle of writing really long reports and you know writing really long application processes and things like that, 
finding a way of supporting people that don't need to rely on that and don't need to replicate the system we're working to change felt like a big aha. So uh, thanks for sharing the methodology. And now Buyu and, and uh, Dee will share about the experience as funders. Thank you. Um, thank you to the methodology team and to yourself, Renata. Um, I was just to really speak about what it's meant to be in the experience of being a slow funder. And this was my second year. Um, the first thing that I want to touch on is how it's changed me. Um, my relationship with the funding models that exist is one where you're accountable to the money and you have to follow the money and follow the rule of the money. And this felt very different. First of all, you are given a lump sum of money alongside the money that you will be dispersing. You're given a lump sum of money just to honor the work that you do in the world. And that money is for you to spend on yourself personally, right? So I re felt really seen by that offering. And um, I felt like there was a gift that just came from the universe to say, we've been journeying with you for a long time and we know you, you need to reach an oasis where somebody just gives you some water to drink and to say, you're doing well, you're doing good. So that was the first experience of just receive, receiving that tranche of money that was just mine to help. Um, the second thing was being able to do that for others, right? Something of just being able to help somebody who's in a difficult position without saying, will you fill out that form? Will you do that? And will you account to me once you've done so? And then we'll see whether you're worthy or not. That felt like a really dignifying experience for a lot of people. So this was not about following the money. It was more about following the person and following the need in the community that they served, um, in the life space that they found themselves. And I work a lot with communities, Black communities within the African context. I live in Cape Town, South Africa myself. And um, it felt good to be able to just touch so many different spaces with money that was going to be impactful because all of a sudden, um, people didn't have to spend money going out to find spaces where they could redeem the money that was said to possibly be available, because that's sometimes the process, right? But there was money that was just coming to them at their doorstep, literally. So it's people that I would have met through um, organizations that I work with, people that are part of the church community that I uh, exist within, people in choir communities that I exist within, people whose circumstances I've understood well, people who've served communities for a long time without any real gain coming out of it. And people that I knew that even if the money were not to be there, they would continue to do what they do because they were doing it beforehand anyway. So it felt like um, it was another level of blessing and honoring the work that they had been doing for a long time. And... Um, the difficulties, I'll speak about that. For me, they had to do with learning to trust. And that was really hard because here's somebody else's money and I'm going to just pass it on to somebody and turn my back and trust that the work will be done. Um, so one of the things that really helped with that for me was coming back to the circle of sisters and hearing how they had done it before in the first year cycle and learning that everybody had the same challenge for the longest time. The first six months I couldn't disperse. I just thought, how do I trust my, how do I know that this is right? Right? Like this, I can't do this with Renata's money. Maybe I should just take it back. I'm not the right person for this. Right? So there were issues around trusting the fundee, trusting myself and just thinking this whole thing is not working. But when I got back into the circle, what I learned was that the answers for that lie in my gut. Because I've been doing this for a long time. I've been working with people in communities, helping them, if not out of my own pocket, by helping to, to locate spaces where they could raise funds um, and meet potential funders um, and helping out in whatever way I could. So it said something about leaning into that knowing and letting that guide the way. And the minute I heard that, I was able to release the funds and I could turn my back and beautiful things happened in my wake and it was incredible. So um, second year on, I feel um, like a very experienced flow funder because now my gut speaks to me before I even have to process this in the head. The gut leads the way because the person that is in front of me is who I follow. I don't follow the money, but I follow the person. It's a very person-centered approach. 
yeah and in doing that I, I i follow the relationship between me and the person holding them up and holding the process of living up and just dignifying the experience of being in this life together this is this has been the experience for me personally and to say a little bit about um raquel's experience she would have been in this group with us but at the moment she's overseeing some of the projects that she is uh, funding on the amazon and um she says that for her, what was really interesting is when she had to refund, because um, one of the things that we decided was that sometimes you just need to just pass on the lump sum as it is to a really amazing project, right? And not split it up and give it to different people. So when she did that, um, she was amazed at how the experience of mistrust and not knowing how to trust your gut was replicated in the fundees that she had passed the money on to. So this is really new. Our guts don't know this but they have to learn it as new. We have to learn to dignify and redignify ourselves. So um, thank you. I'm going to hand over to you, Dee, on that note. And I know that the other flow funders in the space would probably have more to say for themselves. I hope I've represented something of their experience in mind. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Dee from... England and really grateful to be on this journey um, of repair um, with other people from around the world. And the reason why I'm framing it as repair um, is because of our relationship with money, our relationship with each other, um, and how by doing flow funding, we are changing that. And I think for me, it was overcoming that fear, not so much trust, but overcoming fear. Because we've learned, uh, you know, what money is, many falsehoods around money, and not understanding money as an energy, and as a tool, and not something that we own but as something that we can use or it comes through us um, to facilitate work elsewhere. And it's also about that repair of our relationships and especially for us who come from racialized and marginalized communities um, where the relationship hasn't been so so good where we've been on the losing side as, as it were and to be placed in a position where we're redefining what power looks like um in decision making in deciding where money flows um is really really um empowering and we, we've spoken a lot about dignity and I think the core of our work is about that repair and co-creating safety belonging and dignity because that's all we all ever want as human beings and we're co-creating that with each other as a community of practice but we're also co-creating that with the deep consideration and deep listening and deep relationships we are forming um, with the different people and projects that we work with. Thank you. Thanks so much, Will you and Dee. I always get emotional hearing and also remembering our conversations and when you say like, how, you know, how do we know and what, how do we trust our intuition? I think that's part of the disruption that this program enables because we're told our intuition doesn't know. And then we're, we believe in that because we're told that so many times, you know, you need to leave the emotions out of the room and things like that. And that's what we're trying to heal and to rebuild within us. And we'll never know the truth is that. We'll never know what's the most efficient, the most, I don't know, the best way of funding, we'll never know. So I guess if you're, if you're doing the work, that means you're connected to the right people and the money will flow where it needs to. And um, yeah, so 
going to our third round now of sharing from our fellows. I want them to come share their grand stories. And please, if you have any questions, after this sharing, we're going to have a Q&A moment. But also, in the meantime, feel free to uh, put it on the chat, and we'll uh, pick up in a bit, OK? So please, Dani, Jess, and Jyoti. Thanks, Nata. Um, and so in this last section, we're just going to share a, a few glimpses, I think, into the impact of the flow funding. Um, the flow of our funding, so much like water uh, that moves through a river and ultimately into these really beautiful delta spaces. Um, I was going to say was, but I think very much more so is because it, it really continues to be um, very natural and very emergent. And so as much as you shared that kind of initial trepidation, I think once you step into this flow, it's amazing how the resources just really go where they need to. Um, and that they move not only through us uh, and to the people who receive the funding, but they move through the people who've received the funding too, and ultimately reaches those that need it most. And I think um, like my flow sisters who explained in the in the first section in terms of the methodology, so often those who are least seen or able to access this kind of support. Um, so we're going to share a few glimpses into what this has looked like for us. And Joyti will share one of her impact stories. And then Danny will walk us through a few more stories from some of our other Flow Funder sisters um, as just a few examples of the very, very many impacts that have already been made possible. So Joyti, I'm just going to hand over to you here. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so it was amazing to have funding that I can use in such an agile and trust-based and emergent way to work on a theme that I'm very passionate about, which is land justice and the activation of land justice, and particularly supporting um, land workers from diverse and marginalized backgrounds, communities, that's BIPOC people, youth and elderly land workers, and refugee and migrant community, to um, take steps in their journey in ways that would be difficult through a strategic program to be able to finance. Um, and there was a really moving part of this, this funding for me in that um, a few years ago, I went to Gambia. And when I was there, I met um, a young boy who was a, um, a cow milker from a traditional cow milking herd um, whose uh, mother had died. And he, with his young brother, were um, you know, milking the cows and serving milk to the, the um, people at the hostels. And um, we had struck up a conversation about, you know, trying to help him um, gain more knowledge and skills and, and share the skills he had in, in raising the cows um, and going to vet school. And, you know, we'd started on that process. But then he decided to go try and migrate to um, to try and get to Europe because the process of us trying to get in visas to try and come here to work and, and um, go to vet school were getting really long. And he got caught up with loads of smugglers. And this was several months ago. And I think I was with a few of you at a gathering of Farming the Future when, um, you know, it, it was obvious that um, there was a lot of refugee migrant um, youth that were actually um, drowning in boats and he got extremely scared. And so I was able to send him some of the funding to try and get him back. And just day before yesterday, he finally arrived back home to his village. And I was really crying like real tears of joy that he actually got back safe because he's been through Algeria. He's been in and out of prisons. He's been, you know, stuck in the middle of uh, the desert. He was in Niger last week um, trying to get home. And we're, uh, we're on the call yesterday. We're talking to each other about how we want to try and create some communications for his community um, and to the youth that are there about how dangerous that journey is and, and try and work on getting them set up in this business we originally talked about with cows and sharing knowledge about how important it is to actually stay and work with the land and be with your communities to try and prevent this disaster where he met thousands and thousands of these young youth uh, you know, going across Europe uh, I mean, going across to Europe in these dire conditions and many, many died along the journey. And he, he was really, really shaken by how difficult that journey was. So that's just one story that I was able to agilely respond to. And, you know, some of the funding was used to support Moya, who was a refugee from Mozambique that's now come to the UK, who through the medium of hip hop music um, and um, it, another fellow called Ian through hip hop music, share um, their experience with rebonding with the land and land justice through through their music um, at the Land Skills Fair. I was able to bring other people from the BPOC community and marginalized communities to that fair to be able to join into the land justice movement by 
participating, and then go on to subsidize courses for many of those inspired land workers from these communities to be able to gain more skills, was able to support a popular education gathering at Brachioc, uh, a, a project that works with refugee and migrants in the UK um, around land justice, and then also to um, work with Nelson, who's in the photo there, um, who uh, Helena brought over to the UK from Zimbabwe. But then I took um, on a further journey to travel across the UK, speaking to young people um, about what's happening um, in, in, in Africa with cli climate adaptation and land resettlement, and to speak about its experience of land reform in Zimbabwe to inspire um, the, the types of actions we can take here um, in the UK to think about um, land reform and, and inspire those discussions about how we create land justice. So it's all around these themes, but it was amazing to be able to respond so agilely and respond to individuals in a way that could fill in parts of this grand journey we're on to try and have a more just and equitable land system and more people connected to the land in, in many ways. And hopefully they'll all have an impact that flows outwards. Thanks, Joyce. And Danny's going to share with us just some glimpses into what this has looked like. And as she does, I'll be pulling up photos from many of our stories. Danny won't have a chance to speak to all of them, but just to give you a flavor of um, the huge diversity and range of impacts. So, Danny. Hey, uh, I will speak in Portuguese. So, uh, if you don't understand, in, in please change your channel. Ah, como vocês puderam ver, ah, cada flow funder é, tem uma forma particular de ah, fazer as suas atuações. Algumas escolhem apoiar estruturas já vigentes que não tem, que não conseguem ter acesso a recursos, ah, seja por editais ou de outras instituições, ah, seja por dificuldades ah, de regularização dessas instituições ou mesmo quando não são regularizados. E já outras, uh, flow funders preferem fazer apoios uh, a pessoas que jamais teriam esses, essas, esses acessos. Uh, vou falar um pouquinho sobre algumas experiências. Uh, vou falar primeiro das experiências da África do Sul, da Voio e da Ondela, onde ambas atuam é, impulsionando ações com jovens, é, crianças e jovens vulneráveis, né? Seja com é, mostrando outras formas de, de vivências através ah, de ações como contação de história, ah, desenvolvimento de habilidades é, pessoais, profissionais, ah, seja construindo novos espaços. Uh, seja uh, pensando numa alimentação também mais saudável, uh, com tanto um resgate né, da, de áreas, né, através de árvore, com plantação de árvores ancestrais, uh, processos agrícolas mais sustentáveis, né, principalmente com um público que está muito vulnerável, muito próximo de espaços que têm o uso abusivo de álcool, né? Muitas vezes são é, localidades que atuam tanto com crianças como mães que estão gestantes, né? sempre nesses, nesses territórios. Assim. A Ruby traz bastante experiência ah, sobre essa questão do, do, do financiamento, não necessariamente dentro do seu território. A Ruby ela tem uma ação que ela apoiou na Espanha, onde é, são hortas para compartilhar, assim, onde é, a, a, idosos ou pessoas que já estão com algum tipo de deficiência é, ficam em espaços e lá eles passam a cultivar hortas para poder se alimentar, um complemento da sua alimentação, porque esses espaços já são bem precários e esse apoio que ela faz é um apoio é essencial para poder manter esses espaços, né? E também tem um pouco de dificuldade de recursos. E eu também vou falar sobre a experiência daqui do Brasil, em especial do Tião, 
A Tião, ele é um, hoje ele é um agricultor, mas há pouco tempo atrás ele era uh, mais um é, trabalhador do garimpo, né? Tião, ele mora em Altamira. Altamira faz parte da região amazônica. É, Para quem não é do Brasil, essa região de Altamira é a entrada para a exploração da região amazônica. Então, já lá já tem a usina de Belo Monte, que gera grande impacto ambiental, principalmente com as comunidades indígenas. Ah, seu Sebastião, ou Tião, como ele gosta de ser chamado, ele trabalhou muito tempo na informalidade para conseguir construir e manter a sua família. Né? É, entre eles estava essa questão no garimpo, que é uma das principais causas do desmatamento e contaminação dos rios amazônicos. E foi nessa jornada que ele foi é, se afundando em dívida, né? Porque garimpo na Amazônia é uma atividade ilegal, né? E muitas vezes eles são ah, copilados, é, são resgatados, né? Essas situações muitas vezes também são presos. E ele sempre teve um sonho de produzir alimentos, assim. É, se é um agricultor. E a Raquel, uma das nossas co-founders, em uma das visitas ao Pará, ah, conheceu o seu Tião e, numa conversa, ele falou para ela que o sonho dele era ser um agricultor, só que ele não teria condições ah, de tornar isso realidade. E a Raquel falou assim, se o senhor quer, a gente vai fazer acontecer. E isso que aconteceu. A Raquel... Além de dar toda essa questão, a estrutura física que ele precisava para esse terreno, como sombrites, estacas, ela também deu uma consultoria particular. E esse ano, o seu Tião se torna o primeiro agricultor orgânico de Altamira. Assim. Você vai ver um videozinho que a Jess vai soltar, em que ele fala sobre é, um pouquinho sobre essa experiência. Agradecer aí a experiência que o amigo dividiu comigo aí, viu? Muito legal mesmo, ó. Do demais, meu amigo, é pegar essas mangas e ir pra cima, né não? É isso, muito <risos> obrigada. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, and you could see we, we could just go on for so much sharing these incredible stories. Um, In just short, maybe closing on this impact section, section as we'd love to leave some space for questions and, and conversation as well. We reflected that the flow funding, in some cases, there was no sense of right or wrong. And I think that's where this trust element starts coming through in your intuition. In some cases, they had these really profound and deep individual impacts. Some of the funding made possible really meaningful group work um, that otherwise would never have been possible. And in some cases, it was really profound systems impacts. But as I'm sure many of you on the call today will know that none of these are in isolation. And so what we start to see and experience, um, and as time unfolds, is these incredible ripples as individuals influence groups and systems, groups have profound individual and, and systems impacts. And of course, the system impacts us all. Um, so it's with a huge amount of respect and reverence for this experience, as much as it was unnerving at first I think especially stepping into the second year there's so much more confidence and curiosity that starts to be nurtured and just really encouraging those thinking about a model like flow to not stop it too short um so the second year is perhaps where I think a lot of us are finding a depth to the work that wasn't as easily accessible in the first year and on a very personal level kind of closing out for our section I think it's brought a personal impact to each of us that Buyu and Dee spoke to as well more space for trust and intuition um, and even more surprisingly most recently also for patience um, kind of allowing the call and the need to find you as much as you are looking for it um, and certainly a renewed uh, spirit of curiosity and care in each of our individual work and how that in and of itself has tremendous ripples through the system both within the flow but also um, much further beyond the flow funding support 
Uh, so thank you for this opportunity to share with you just a glimpse into what we have had the tremendous privilege of being a part of. And I'll hand back to Hanata um, from here. Thanks so much, ladies. I always love listening to the stories. Uh, I think that's also part of the magic, right? You expressed it really well when you talk about individuals, groups, and systemic change like movements. It's like so many layers that can be addressed by this methodology, if we can call it like that. And they all need to happen at the same time. So there's no, no hierarchy in which one is better. They're all needed. And sometimes all someone needs is a bunch of tools and then they can get going with a huge project and sometimes all they need is like a ticket you know so it's like that i think that's part of the magic so i'll answer julia's question in a minute but just to remind for those who got here a bit later flow funding was bdr's first program we're in our fourth year now and this year the fellows actually designed their kind of the journey of the program defining that is a three-year cycle so the way we expand our circles are either creating new circles which we're doing or co-funding new circles which we're about to do in brazil with a few people present in this call as well but then the idea is that the current flow funders nominate new flow funders and that's how we slowly expand our network and also the idea is that the from the due diligence process to the reporting process, the idea is to debureaucratize as much as possible, make it very relational, and serve multiple uh, purposes at the same time. So for example, this webinar, it's to share with you all about this program. We're also recording it to send it to the charity commission. We're gonna also use it as a content creation. So we try to optimize everyone's time as well. So I'm going to start with Julia's question. Let me just scroll up here uh, about how flow funders are selected. So basically, uh, Bid the Earth does everything we do for the first time. We do with people we know, and we do it as a pilot. So we started by inviting people from, like, there was no gender cut or, or nationality cut necessarily. It was just people that we admired and had a relationship and knew they were in touch with people working on the ground and we invited them to be part of the pilot and then actually the pilot was a volunteer year so people weren't paid to be part of that and that was the original concept Marion Weiber created she would invite volunteers to do the work and then we realized that that was a little incoherent with our own let's say speech we were used to we always say how we need to value skills that are not uh, necessarily like financially visible and how can you uh, take for granted all the time these people are working on the ground building a network you know no having the right eye to kind of select who they think are the right receivers for it so the second year we moved to only women equally three women from each country so our three geographies are brazil south africa and the uk so we kind of created this pattern and we chose them through our own existing relationships and also through nomination of the group so uh, sometimes we know someone on the country either they're not on the ground or i don't know uh, they're not available so we'll ask like who do you know who do you trust and it's totally trust-based so you don't do any formal selection process it's a conversation it's explaining what we expect from them and then this year, uh, they're each receiving £2,000 uh, as a stipend for their time, and they're disbursing £8,000. Um, so that's how we've been evolving. And each year we tweak a bit. It was a long journey to understand how to flow money to certain countries like Brazil. It was really complicated. It took us nine months to find out a way to send let's say institutional charitable money from the uk to individuals in brazil so each country has their own challenges uh, and yeah it's a journey each expansion we do or each new member we take on we learn a lot about finance and loss and usually lawyers say you cannot do that because it's very gray area so we try to believe actually if it's gray, we can do it and we just need to 
trust, <laughs> right? If that's what we're telling the world, let's try to practice it ourselves. So let's see their summary. Um, so we have a website uh, that has some stories. Our website is being updated and we have some videos from previous years. We're gonna also make this pr uh, recording available. Uh, I also know there are other groups that are doing flow funding around the world that we're connected to that have amazing kind of guide. There's this group called Kindle Project. I don't know if any of our team members can type their website there because they actually created a guide, almost like a step-by-step -step how to do your own flow funding. So I really recommend checking that out. Um, thank you. So in terms of Be the Earth setup, um, how do we manage the circus, circles? Circus. <laughs> uh, so basically, we are organizing a sociocratic model. So I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a governance model that is decentralized. It's very similar to flow funding, but in terms of governance. So each circle has autonomy to run their own things and make decisions and all that, of course, aligned with our overall strategy. Uh, and then we have our program circle. So I lead that circle and I facilitate the meetings with the groups. And there's an amazing team that most of you probably met at least one of them. So Jess helps us with comms. Um, Claire helps us with all the backstage structure and systems, scheduling meetings, making sure things are organized so we can find the information after. Gabi also supporting with comms and sometimes supporting with translation as well as she's bilingual and with the overall kind of long-term strategy, Tessa as well. So we have like multiple parts that play different roles, but yeah, uh, that I hope that answers your question and we're happy to share more about that as well. So for the fourth round, yeah, so, so we wanna keep doing this circle with three women from each geography and then once they get to their final year, they nominate someone and we're gonna start a whole new circle with new women, but in the same structure. And then besides that, we're starting two new flow funders, which is actually uh, brand new news. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that here publicly, but I will anyway. Uh, so we're starting one flow funding that we're calling the wisdom keepers. So our people that have been guiding our, us and our work uh, either through our existing relationships or we've done courses they ran, but there are people that are uh, more advanced, let's say also mostly elders that are leading the themes that are very important to us. And we're gonna have a circle of seven people around the globe. Uh, some of them were here like Helena Norber Hodges and Satish Kumar and Vandana Shiva and other people that are kind of names that are big references to us. So we're really excited to work with them on that flow funding. Uh, and then we're also, we just did a gathering with other funders in Brazil. And from that gathering emerged another flow funding, which was proposed by another funder. And it was really nice because now we're five funders there. A few of them are in this call as well. And we're in the process of nominating who's gonna be part of it. And the idea is also that once we nominate someone, they nominate someone else, because I think that's a challenge of the trust-based philanthropy model. You can only trust who you know, but then if you only work with who you know, it's not fair, right? Because it's like a network dependent thing. So that's one way we found so far that has been working, that is going a step further, that is reaching out other, to other people that our trusted friends trust. So we're setting up this circle in Brazil, it's gonna be focusing mostly on favelas uh, leaderships to invest in their own territory. So we're really excited about that. Um, okay, sorry. I, thought, um, I don't know if any of the flow funders want to add anything after everyone shared. We still have a few minutes or any other questions. You also can say them out loud. You don't need to only type them.
Okay. I'll take Hi, that everyone. as okay. Go on. Hi. Um, I already asked my question in the chat, but um, I just wanted to. My name is Sammy. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a, a project that um, also does participatory grant making in this way, um, specifically for climate justice. And my question came from a place of um, of knowing all these conversations that are going around around quote decolonizing philanthropy or dismantling the power dynamics within philanthropy and understanding that like the most progressive funders that I know don't see themselves ex existing in in the near future and so I'm I'm curious about how lean we can make these projects right and that's why I asked about the setup um, because in my case right now it's like we got unrestricted funding from a big funder and it's I'm a climate justice organizer and I am working to move money to other climate justice organizers with the aim of strengthening the climate justice movement. And so there's very little funder involvement in what we're doing. And so constantly working with my funder on how they can reduce the necessity of themselves basically. And I don't know, maybe you could say a little bit more about that and how you're thinking about that at Be The Earth. Um, that would be really interesting for me, thanks. Pleasure, thank you. Uh, I forgot to mention that actually be, uh, flow funding is the easiest program we run. <laughs> it's the least admin and the least bureaucracy and you know like we do meetings because we want to do the community building but some people don't even do the meetings like Marion Weber who originally created the program she used to give the money and then a year later they would meet in person and share the stories and that was all the demand they had from the the flow funders so it's amazing and again i think like the other fellows shared that maybe they can add something to this answer is like in the beginning is like really are you really not gonna try to control me and are you really not gonna you know intervene and give a say on our decision so yes and that's a bit of a disconstruction we need to do internally to then build this trust and this space for the intuition and basically yeah um i love that the name you have on your uh on your zoom is collective abundance because that's exactly the representation of it so um i don't know for any of the flow funders if you want to add how it is the process for you in terms of like demands or uh i don't know not having us controlling to whom and what you do with the money when ah eu posso falar ah vamos lá primeiro é uma grande surpresa ah Esse é meu segundo ano como Flow Funder. Me falaram no primeiro ano que era só seguir sua intuição, seguir seu coração e que as coisas iriam funcionar. Mas sempre aquele receio de surpresa, vamos fazer um relatório? Eu tenho um caderninho onde eu anotava cada ação que eu fazia e todas as histórias, assim, bem guardadinho. Assim. Então, cada transferência que eu fazia, eu anotava e escrevia a história por trás dessa 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 doação essa distribuição de recurso e quando eu vi que no final o que importava eram os relatos eu falei meu Deus isso é verdade então a gente pode distribuir assim e e possibilitando outras vivências e quando as pessoas que são beneficiárias, a gente fala, ah, me manda uma foto. Não, mas você não quer a lista de tudo que eu comprei? Não, só me manda a foto. E se deu certo, se não deu certo. Então, é muito é, empoderador, assim. É, não no sentido de me achar que eu posso mais, mas poder conseguir olhar para essas pessoas e ter a, a autonomia e a autoestima de falar, nossa, essa escolha que eu fiz foi uma sábia escolha para poder ajudar essas pessoas. 
Obrigada. Anne, você quer adicionar algo? Sim, eu sou Anne. I'm just um, sorry. I I have my colleague here, so you got might get a little bit of <laughs> microphone. Um, I'm just uh, just to follow up on Sammy's uh, questions um, that speak to Bidyard's strategy beyond flow funding. So flow funding is one of the ways we chose how to do stuff early on. We have realized that how we disperse funds is as much as important, if not much more than what we are funding. But on the other, uh, on, on another note, we are also very aware of uh, at this day and age, we try not to uh, get hijacked by buzzwords such as decolonizing philanthropy type of thing, but we are very aware that at this day and age is crucial and it's important that the funders and the funding world as a sector starts to inquire about their role. And one of one part that we are trying to address and we are trying to champion is beyond flow funding, evidently the alignment between all we do philanthropically and what we have been doing on the other side that uh, most people don't uh, touch much. They treat as a separate sector, which is the impact investing and other investments uh, that also speak to the massive amount of capital that we have available um, and could potentially be used in more regenerative, more nurturing ways. So I'm happy to, to talk more, and we are all at BDRF very available to talk more. This is just a piece of our work, uh, but definitely integrated to um, a bigger conversation, which is what is the role of philanthropy together with impact investment um, in the poly crisis, which is also part of what we are inquiring and the learnings that we're, uh, yeah, the, journey, the learning journey that we are embarked upon. Thanks, Anne. And I'll take that as a good hook to close our time together. Thank you so much for the fellows for, well, for being you <laughs> to start with, for saying yes to this journey of collective learning and sharing your experience and sharing yeah, your wisdom, your network, your passions with us. Thanks be the earth for enabling this to happen. Thanks Jess for organizing this webinar and yeah bringing all these great people to be here with us and as Anne said we're available there are lots of details and kind of operational things that we could share here but we don't have enough time for that so feel free to get in touch and hope to see you uh, in other spaces you can always subscribe to our newsletter and follow our Instagram to learn more about what we've been doing or the events we're hosting and we'd love to see you again. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much.